Hello and welcome, Pokemon fans. There are those who call me Bard Breaker, and it's time for another Pokemon Challenge run. Last week, we took on Pokemon Emerald with just a Scyther, and that, while not having a lot of move variety, turned out to be a pretty interesting run. In fact, according to the analytics, you guys have liked that run the best. So let's keep things going with another run like that, and have another awesome Pokemon like Scyther, and ask and answer the question, can I beat Pokemon Diamond with only a Magmar? And a real quick side note, guys, I know I was trying to get videos uploaded on Mondays moving forward. If you guys saw the community posts that I put up on the channel, I actually got called into my job on Sunday, which was my day off, and I basically didn't have any time to to work on this, so this is why this video is getting pushed back. Anyway guys, Magmar is of course the fire type Pokemon introduced back in Generation 1 and is perhaps best known as Blaine's signature Pokemon in the anime and the epic fight against Ash's Charizard. Magmar rings in with a base stat total of 495, which actually puts it 5 points lower than last week's Scyther, and into the same class as Pokemon like Beedrill, Nidoqueen, and Toxapex. Our HP and defense aren't fantastic, but our special attack and attack are pretty darn good. Even our speed is actually pretty nice and is admittedly faster than I thought it would be. Those stats are really nice and will really help make the most out of our moveset. Saying of which, let's take a look. We start with Smog and Leer, which are mostly useless, but at least Ember will be a nice 60 base power move when accounting for our same type attack bonus. There's loads of pretty solid moves here like Faint Attack, Flamethrower, and I may even keep Confuse Ray for those cheeky plays. By TM, we don't really have a load of very unique options. It's mostly just the stuff we already learned by level up and the usual moves that just about everything else can learn. Though hopefully we will make use of the fact that we can learn Psychic. That is certainly going to be helpful. In any event guys, like always, these scripts get written as I go, so at this point I haven't started playing the game yet. Everyone take your guesses down below in the comments to please the almighty algorithm, god of the YouTube algorithm, and let me know if you think I can do this or not. I'm going to say it's definitely possible possible, though I could definitely see us having issues with anything that knows water or ground moves, so I'm sure we won't have any issues come the Elite Four, or Crash or Wake, or those pesky random trainers with random Gyaradoses. Um, anyway, in closing, let's go over the rules quickly. In battle, I can only use Magmar. I'll need other utility Pokemon for things like HMs, but I won't be allowed to use those Pokemon in battle. I also will not be using any items in battle. I will allow myself the use of items outside of battle as well as held items though. And lastly, I won't be taking advantage of any cheats, glitches, or exploits aside from replacing our starter with Magmar. So let's get to it. So we start our adventure in Sinnoh off by running into the lake with our buddy Tim. We ignore warnings to stay off the grass, and after reenacting a scene from the blockbuster hit Birdemic, we conveniently find some Pokemon in a suitcase to defend ourselves. I've also used the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to replace Chimchar with Magmar so that we can do the entire run with it. This will also ensure our rival takes Piplup, giving him the Water Starter, which will be the hardest for us to fight throughout the run. While we don't one-shot the bird that's attacking us, we cook it up extra crispy and bring it down with burn damage. From there we make our way back to San Gem Town where Professor Tree allows us to keep the Magmar, which I nickname Mr. Toasty, because I don't know, I'm bad at nicknames. In any case, we take a look at Mr. Toasty and we find that we're quirky in nature, which means neutral stat gains, and that's totally fine. Our ability is Flame Body, which is really nice. That means that any time we make contact with a Pokemon, or one makes contact with us, there's a 30% chance we'll inflict a burn on them, which is absolutely great. Not only do burns inflict damage over time, but they also cut their attack stat in half. And also apparently the flame body ability means that if we're hatching eggs, they'll hatch twice as fast, but that's not going to be important in this run. What will be important though is having something for cut later, so we catch up a Bidoof, nickname it Snipticus the 44th, Long Long he cut, cut, and proceed to Jubilife City. We take care of housekeeping in town by picking up the town map from Tim and mugging some clowns to get coupons for a Pip-Boy. Or um, a, a poke -etch? Once we get out of town, we're ambushed by Tim, who's added a bird to his team, but we're still able to ember our way past him without much incident at all. Even considering the fact that Piplup resists our ember. Once it learns something wet though, we may have some issues. Once we get to the next town, Orberg City, we find that the gym leader isn't at home and we have to go dig him out of the local mine. Here I stop and catch a Geodude along the way for strength later, nicknaming it by Septicus the 44th, Long, Long may she lift, and once we find Rourke, we take a crack at the rock gym. Now rock is one of our weaknesses and we don't have a huge level advantage here so we can't just come in here swinging and steamroll his team. I take a few attempts, and while I do make it to the Kranidos about half the time, I just need a couple extra levels here. I'm not super worried about it, so let's go get him and see. Two levels higher, and I try this again at level 16. I opt to make every first move be a smokescreen to chunk their accuracy. Rock, though, is already less than 100% accurate, so this helps us stay in the fight. Ultimately, it starts to look pretty good, because we don't actually take damage from the Geodude or the Onyx. Kranidos, though, makes up for that in a hurry, though, but we inflict a burn to help our cause and fortunately win our match reasonably quickly enough to secure the first badge. Heading north, we get to Floroma Town and have our first real encounters with Team Evil at the Valley Windworks. And while normally we can have some issues with this Perugly, this time though we don't have any issues at all, burning her team down with Ember. And with that, we've been given our first taste of Team Evil who are bent on, um, I honestly don't care, they're always filler, I don't know, probably something to do with making bad pizza again. 
Next up on the docket is a trip through Eterna Forest, and unlike Viridian Forest, in this one we have help. Cheryl is lost and needs help through the spooky, scary sequoia trees, and she has a chancy and offers to escort us through the woods. She acts like a Pokemon Center after every encounter, meaning no matter how badly we get hurt, which is barely at all given that we're a Magmar against stuff like Burmy and Cascoon, she heals us back to full health. This is also a great opportunity to do some shiny hunting since you get to see twice as many encounters at once, but alas, no luck this time. Once I reach level 30, which is admittedly probably overleveling a bit more than I need to, we make our way into Eterna City and it's home of the Grass Gym. And in a turn of events that I'm sure will make each and all of you very surprised, we fire punch down her entire team without so much as a second glance. Okay, admittedly those extra levels we got in the forest proved unnecessary here, but I'm sure they'll be needed later when we meet Crasher Wake down the road, so let's just roll with it. Speaking of rolling, they be hatin' as we roll our way down Cycling Road and just off the way we stop and pick up a Krikatoon for Flash later, nicknaming it Flashelius the 44th, Long May He Shine, and head to Hearthome City. Once here, we encounter our friend Tim once again, who's trying his best to stop us, but really can't at this point. His Piplup has evolved, but we luckily burn it, and then hilariously he tries to use Metal Claw on us. Despite the attack drop from the burn, and the fact that we have the type advantage, we quickly dispatch the rest of his team and make our way down the road to Veilstone City. The Veilstone Gym contains Maylene and the Fighting Gym, and because we've learned Flamethrower, she's an easy sweep through her entire team without issue. I wish I could say more here, but I was kinda distracted by The Simpsons on Disney Plus and didn't feel like going back to watch the fight. Speaking of not a lot to say, there's really not a lot happening between here and Pastoria City where we have our next gym match against the water gym leader Crasher Wake, and this is one I'm admittedly kind of worried about. His Gyarados is out first and we hit it hard with a lava plume and it goes for Dragon Rage for some reason. It's always guaranteed to do 40 damage, but it does no brine, which would be super effective against us, so I'm not sure why it's using it. So, future me note here, I actually looked it up, and if the Pokemon Showdown calculator is to be believed, brine, despite being super effective, would actually only do about 20 to 26 damage to us, meaning Dragon Rage is the better choice. Smart move, AI. Eventually, I flamethrower the Gyarados down, and out comes Quagsire. We hit hard with flamethrower, and instead of using something like super effective Mud Bomb, it goes for Mud Sport to reduce electric damage, even though we don't have any electric moves. This Quagsire must just be here to take a bullet for the Float Soul. It's part ground. It can't be hit by electric moves. All right then. After it heals with a super potion, we flamethrower it down, and outlasts its Float Soul. It too has brine, but it doesn't matter as we get off a critical hit flamethrower for the one shot against Crash Awake and secure our fourth badge on our first attempt. After securing the fourth badge, we then find a Team Evil Grunt contemplating, um, evil, and we give chase. Of course our rival Tim has to stop us to fight us, cause that's not gonna be a problem to just stop in the middle of a chase, but after a few quick flamethrowers we manage to sweep through the fight without incident and continue the pursuit before quickly defeating the Grunt and joining up with Cynthia, who for some reason is sending us out on package delivery simulator to go cure some Psyducks. Why are we always playing doctor or police officer? Why can't we just be Pokemon trainers? Along the way to deliver the medicine, I stop and catch a Staravia for Fly later, nicknaming it Flapsity the 44th, Long May She Fly, and then proceed to deliver the Ibuprofen to the headache-stricken ducks. From there, Cynthia gives us her locket to take to her grandma. Yay, another round of package delivery simulator it is then. Before we do that though, we need to find Defog. After bumbling around the Safari Zone for too long, I discover that it's right here at the entrance to the park. I can't be expected to talk to every NPC in the game, and I also can't be expected to remember where everything is in Diamond since this is actually my first run through it. I've done a few runs through Platinum, but actually only one run through Pearl and none of Diamond thus far. I quickly move through the region and make our way to Celestic Town where I deliver the locket to the old Biddy, and I'm quickly reminded that unlike in Platinum where we have a fight against Cyrus here, we actually don't have anything like that here in this game. We just have a little conversation to shut him up and move on with his day. So at this point, I don't look it up, but I think what I'm supposed to do is go to the ghost gym. And sure enough, Fantima has returned to her spot, but she's cleverly hidden herself behind some road signs. But look guys, we can't keep stopping at every sop, yelled, or one vase sign along the way. So eventually, we press on to Fantima. And at this point, I opt to put the wise glasses on Magmar. I doubt I'll actually need them, but I decide it's better if I have them on. They'll boost the power of my special attacks by 20%, which I believe faint attack is. Speaking of faint attack, why is dark super effective against ghosts? I really don't get that. If anything, ghosts come out of the darkness. Shouldn't ghosts be immune to dark? Chalk that up to another one of those matchups that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, why is rock weak to ground? In any event, aside from some aftermath damage from her ghost balloon, we don't have any trouble defeating her with just three faint attacks, and from there, it's time to trip across the pond to Candelave City. But first, we need to find ourselves a surfer, so we go back to the Safari Zone and scoop up a Meryl, nicknamed it Aquides the 44th, Long May She swim, swim, and then head to Candelave. Once in Candelave, it's at this point that our rival and local bridge guardian troll Tim appears to challenge us to a battle to get across the river. 
and normally in a lot of these runs this fight actually proves a bit difficult. I think I usually have to grind to get past him, but at this point we're somehow already awfully high level and I really don't know how that happened, but it is what it is. Thanks to this, we actually don't have a lot of hardships against him in this fight, though just to give him a small glimmer of hope, I allow him, and by allow him I mean I didn't have a choice since I didn't crit the print blub, to get off a fury attack. Again with the water Pokemon not using water moves against a fire type, but okay, before we close out the win against his Heracross and Roserade. Now it's on to the Steel Gym and I predict another easy sweep. And speaking of which, yeah, Byron doesn't turn out to be even remotely difficult, as we come along with Flamethrower and melt his Steel Pokemon into pools of metal that surely won't reform themselves into another Terminator and chase after us. We head on into the library where we do some research, or planning, or something. Honestly, I'm not sure. Something about stopping Team Evil, I suppose. I wasn't really paying attention. It goes on for a while, even with a speed up. But our next task is to go visit some of the local lakefront properties to run Team Evil out. There's really nothing difficult here, just more filler to bloat the games a bit. I guess looking back on Pokemon as a 30 year old, I see more of the junk in the games. I don't know, did you all wonder why there was so much not Pokemon in your Pokemon games when you were younger? In any case, we make our way through the blizzard and make our way into Snow Point City where we take an immediate run to the ice gym. And I honestly I honestly think the snowball puzzles here in Diamond and Pearl are more difficult than the one in Platinum, but that's beside the point. The real point is her ice Pokemon don't stand a chance against me, especially in light of the fact that at least two of them are quad weak to fire. And just like that we burned down another chunk of the Amazon rainforest and secured another badge for the collection. With that it's time for another bout of Team Evil shenanigans, this time against the biggest, baddest, and barbiest boss of them all, Cyrus. And yeah, we just fry up his team with some flamethrowers, but his team is about to get a fair bit harder in the next encounter, or at least that's what Game Freak wanted when they designed it. Saying of which, it's immediately time for that next fight against Cyrus. That didn't take long at all. There's not much to this one either, honestly. The Haunchcrow goes down quickly enough, but the Gyarados is finally an issue which hits hard with Aqua Tail. I get some good luck though as I confuse it and it hits itself and we bring it down. From there, the Weavile and the Crobat don't stand any chance at all. After that, it's time to face down Dialga and we beat the box legendary with a single flamethrower, which albeit was a crit, but either way, a win's a win. Speaking of wins, we make our way to the final gym in the game, and it's an electric gym. And while in the show, Magmar created an air lens to deflect Pikachu's electricity, we have no such world-breaking physics here. That being said, we do have the level advantage, plus our flamethrower has been keeping us afloat all run, so we don't have any struggles here either. With that victory, we get another badge in our book and secure our final badge of the run. And now we can move on to the Elite Four. But before we can do that, Wally challenges us once again, and though we actually did lose our first attempt thanks to a lucky paralysis from the Snorlax's body slam, our second run is an easy flamethrower sweep. Bug Trainer Twink Aaron is up first, as usual in these Gen 4 runs, and as you've probably come to expect, we don't have a lot of issues thanks to our fire moves. It's really not all that difficult against him at all because he's a bug type specialist. Though it is pretty interesting when you think about it that bugs are weak to fire, but not things like flying types. I mean if you threw a bird into a fire pit, it wouldn't exactly be any better off than if you threw a bug into the fire. But yeah, I am Pokemon typing for the win I guess. Unfortunately for us, although somewhat expectedly, Bertha the Ground Master of the Elite Four really puts us in a bind. I make several runs at her and we just get our ass handed to us again and again. I know we're weak to rock and ground, but man. Alright, we're just gonna have to come back and try something else. So I opt to leave the Elite Four for a bit and go pick up the TM for Psychic. It's hopefully gonna be more effective against Bertha. It's not exactly great, but it'll do. Unfortunately, even that doesn't give us what we need and we still lose to Bertha again and again against her damn pseudo Wudo. We're gonna have to try this again. Fortunately for us though, that again just means our very next attempt is we have some decent luck with Confuse Ray. Yeah, remember that fourth move that we've barely touched all run? Suddenly we find ourselves having to have a bit of strategy here, but thanks to Confuse Ray we just get enough stalling and extra self-inflicted damage off to secure the win. But that is honestly one of the hardest fights we've had all run thus far. But what we have in difficulty with Bertha, we easily make up the time with our fight against Flint the Fire Master, even though a lot of his team aren't fire types. But between Psychic, Faint Attack, and even a Flamethrower for his random Steelix, we bring him down with ease. His team in Diamond and Pearl is a lot easier than his team in Platinum. What a change they made here when they got around to Platinum. Our fight against Lucian goes about the same, though we did lose the first attempt thanks to him getting a bit of extra damage, but there's not a lot to say here either, just like the Flint fight. We're able to simply brute force over his team. Between Faint Attack giving us super effective damage against his entire team and the raw power of Flamethrower with its same type attack bonus, I quickly dispatch the final member of the Elite Four and now all that's standing between us and the win is Cynthia the Champion. So I heal up, Elixir up, and take a shot at her. And oh boy is Cynthia a problem. Her Spear Tomb normally doesn't do much, but it also has no weaknesses in Gen 4, so we have to two-shot it with Flamethrower. 
Gastrodon, being water and ground, isn't exactly fun to deal with either, as it requires us to use Confuse Ray in order to stand a shot at bringing it down. Otherwise, it uses Muddy Water. Milotic is generally easy enough if we can get some Confusion Luck and some decent damage from Return. We've made it to the Guard Chop a couple of times, but we just don't have any success from there. I don't really think there are any moves I could get that would be particularly useful. Our hidden power type is Water, something that would have been good against Bertha had I noticed it. I think I just discounted it against the Quagsire too quickly, but that won't help me here. I honestly don't know what else I can do here aside from just brute force leveling up. Our moveset isn't going to give us a lot of options. This is where I would use the TM for Attract. If I had one, it's locked in the post game apparently. But I think I got this. I just need some really good confusion or critical hit luck. I actually did make it past the guard chop once, and had I not misclicked Psychic against Lucario, I would have probably one shot it with Flamethrower, and then the Roserade wouldn't have stopped. Alright, let's keep trying. So I actually realized that one of the problems is that the Garchomp is actually still outspeeding me. So before I go too crazy with grinding and whatnot, I decide to see if the three rare candy I picked up along the way will be enough to let me outspeed Garchomp. Sure enough they do, but that's still not going to guarantee me the win by any means. I still have to have a lot go our way, but I keep trying until I have a good feeling about this run. Eventually, I get this run. Spiritomb is first, and we hit it with the usual salvo of Flamethrower as it hits back with Psychic. She uses a full restore here, which would normally allow us the free win, but after the first Flamethrower, she swaps to Gastrodon to take the hit from the second one. With Gastrodon out, I then go for Confuse Ray on it as it hits hard with a Stone Edge. I go for Return as it misses with Muddy Water, which allows us to finish it off with Psychic. Milotic is next, and it's a special defense tank, so we Confuse it early, and after it hits itself, I go for Return. She hits herself again, and we bring her down with another Return. Pseudo Legendary Garchomp is next, and we are finally outspeeding it, so we Confuse it early, and after it hits itself, we go for Psychic for passable damage as it uses Brick Break to give itself a burn. I don't know why it didn't just use Earthquake for the win there. I'll take it, but man, dumb AI is dumb sometimes. A Citrus Berry heals it up a bit, and we nearly bring it down with another Psychic after it hits itself. We did get the special drop on it though, so that's mega helpful as now we can two-shot it with Psychic after she full restores. Lucario is next, but it's part steel, so it goes down to an easy flamethrower. Her nearly fainted Spiritomb is out next, and before we can finish it off, she just potion stalls with another full restore, but that allows us to bring it down with two hits instead of one. We only have one flamethrower left though, but her last Pokemon is the Grass-type Roserade, which of course goes down to our last flamethrower, and boom, there it is, we've beaten the champion and get Magmar into the Hall of Fame. The credits roll and this run comes to a close. And that was a pretty interesting run if I do say so. Much like Scyther, we didn't have a lot of obstacles, but for almost the exact opposite reason of Scyther. While we both have great stats, Scyther, at least in the gen we did it, has an abysmal moveset and has to rely on boosting moves like Swords Dance and Focus Energy to truly be effective. Magmar, on the other hand, has very similar stats, but instead of boosting moves, it just has actual good moves at its disposal like Flamethrower. I could have used Fire Blast, yes, but I don't like the inaccuracy. I'd rather take the Power Cut and trade for more consistent accuracy. Remember folks, if it's not 100% accurate, it might as well be 10% accurate. In any case guys, thanks for watching. Hope you all enjoyed. I've got some more gimmicky runs in the pipeline, so hopefully we'll be doing more of those here soon. As always, if you have any suggestions, feel free to leave them down below and in the suggestions of my Discord server. Until next time, folks, like, comment, subscribe, and go catch them all.